Hey, hey, hey. Good morning. Good afternoon. How are we? Whatever we are. Yeah, well, that's it. I just was thinking about that as we were going through the intro. So, Mike, you're in Anchorage, right? Yeah, in uh, just outside of Anchorage, Alaska this morning. Yep. And, Tom, you're in New Hampshire today? Exeter, New Hampshire, yes. And I'm here in Southern California, so I just was thinking we should have had an additional guest today that's somewhere in Florida, and we got everybody surrounded. Yeah, Texas or somewhere like that. We Texas would have been better right in the middle, but yeah. anyway. Yeah, but uh, we're, we're close. So, Mike Mortensen, thanks for being with us with ARG Industrial. We're happy to have you with us today. We're going to talk more with you a little bit about uh, your company and so forth. But, uh, Tom, what's uh, kind of what do we got happening today? What do we talk about a little bit? Well, we're back to our, our bit of our normal format, so we'll, we'll start off with a bit of um, some economic news, and then that seems to dovetail really nicely into uh, AI, um, which we have some AI discussions, and I oh, know, wait, Mike, you're so looking unlike forward us. to that. I know, <laughs> I know. And then I know we have some pretty interesting, actually, the scuttlebutt this week is is pretty interesting, some of the stuff on there with with some of the school stuff, so looking forward to that, and then some good articles, and there we go. And then we have Mike Franz in Minnesota. So that's all right. That's good. We're covering it. Yeah. And um, we go. Have Mike and, with and us. Brian, I think, is up in the Bay Area. Right. So that's right. Good morning, yeah. Brian. Good morning, Mike. Um, yeah. yeah Chip in. Let's see if we can get all hit, hit all 50 states. <laughs> that's that's perfect. Well, hey, before we, got, we dive I mean, in. Mike and I got the oddball states covered. So, <laughs> yeah. so we can get the rest. <laughs> And, and you have the oddball part covered as well with the oddball. I've got the state. oddball, too. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you got no, that, that's your job. That's yeah. your job. Mike, you knew what you were in for when you showed up that's today, right. right? That's right. Yeah. Mike's, Mike's ready to hang out. up. He's like, I'm done with this. I'm out of here. That's right. Well, let's <laughs> uh, let's do a little housekeeping and then we'll chat with Mike a little bit. But uh, just uh, those of you who are joining us uh, live this morning, we're on LinkedIn Live, Facebook Live, and YouTube Live. My name's Kevin Brown. I'm with my business partner and lifelong friend, Tom Burton. We get together every week here on LinkedIn live, as I said, Facebook live and YouTube live. But later in the day, this will be up on all of the, the recording will be up on all of the uh, popular podcast formats as well. So little disclaimer here, if you're listening later in the day on the podcast, you will not be seeing the newsletter that we will be talking about today. But that's the format of our broadcast that we do each week. We get together, we kind of talk about all the things happening in the economy, in the world, uh, in wholesale distribution and manufacturing, we look at economic factors, mergers and acquisitions, sales and marketing, technology, AI, all of these different things. We try and bring them all the way back around to how that impacts wholesale distribution and manufacturing. So if you do not get the newsletter and you'd like to get that newsletter, there's two simple ways to get it. First is, and the simplest is, send us an email. Email address is hello at leadsmarttech.com. And we'll get that right out to you. Or we have a website for the podcast now. It's called aroundthehornpod.com. All of our previous episodes are there. You can see upcoming events, guests that we have coming, as well as you can subscribe there. So a lot going out. But again, if you're uh, listening, we are talking about that email that goes out every week. So enough of that. Mike, my friend, I am uh, I was just thinking this morning, I've been wanting to have you with us for quite some time. You're the president and CEO of ARG, uh, your distribution company throughout the Pacific Northwest, right? In Alaska, yeah, you want to give us a little feedback? You bet. Thanks, Kevin, Tom. I appreciate being here. This is, uh, it's always fun to listen to you guys uh, go over all these topics. <laughs> but yeah, um, I'm, I'm the president and CEO of ARG Industrial. I've uh, been with the company for uh, almost 29 years. Um, uh, we are headquartered in Anchorage, Alaska, with locations across the state of Alaska, Washington, Oregon, uh, serving Idaho, Montana, uh, even down into Northern California a little bit. So um, we're in the uh, fluid conveyance, hose and fittings, lifting and rigging verticals, um, kind of a semi-family owned culture roots, but uh, we became a 100% employee owned company in uh 2006. And so that's been our story since then. And about 200 employees, 12 locations. Um, I tease and tell people that we are a, we're a tech company that plays in industrial distribution. So I love that. Well, you know what? <laughs> it, it's funny. Um, I don't know who actually made this comment because I've heard it. It um, 
attributed to Jeff Bezos before, but with the Amazon, but then I had heard that that's not the case. But the comment was every company is a tech company. You just yeah. have some other way that you sell a widget or do something else to, to do that. But we've all got to be tech companies. And I don't think that's ever been more true than today. And Mike, I, you know, it's interesting. It makes me think, right. We, we met and developed what I'm enjoying as a, a newfound friend uh, in all of our conversations. We met, through technology, right? Technology, for sure. And, I and, we've, and our friendship has kind of been across technology, right? We, we exactly haven't met right. Yeah, I, 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 lot, it's funny. I'll, I'll give this quick example before we move into our topics today. But Tom's, uh, he's uh, uh, written a book about, uh, it's called The Revenue Zone, and it talks about buyer behavior and things like that. And Tom's also involved in another podcast about so, uh, social selling. And you know what? We developed a relationship because I saw one of your posts somewhere and we weren't connected. And I just started following you for a while and loved your content and started commenting on things. And I'll never forget because all of a sudden when I reached out to connect, it was a Sunday night and we spent about a half hour (laughs) chatting across LinkedIn on on a Sunday night at like nine o'clock. And here we are. So, and that's more common than not. I can't tell you, you know, like yeah. being in the industry that we're in, so many people are are waking up to this. It's kind of a late adoption industry, right? The hose and fittings guys, the lifting and rigging yeah. guys, we're, we're greasy, dirty business, and and more and more are waking up to that. And so I'm having like the conversations I'm having around uh, my industry are not about the product or even the customers. It's about the tech and the and the employees adopting the tech and all right. of that. So it's been fun. That's great. Good. Hey, Tom, you want to join in on the discussion? Uh, yeah, what were you guys talking about? <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm admiring here. So we have we have Tom May, who he's North Carolina, right? Yes, he yeah. Um, he's right, out, right, right, then, out, right outside of uh, Charlotte. And then we have Duncan in Canada somewhere. So that's good. Yep. Um, and so that's another one. And then Pierre, we have here, I think, hey, Florida, Pierre. right? So, I was just with Pierre this week. Yep. Right. He's, he's uh, right. He's a good friend of ours. We have a, uh, uh, through his company, Moblico, we have uh, an integration and a technology partnership with our company, Lead Smart Technologies, who actually sponsors our event today. So I missed mentioning that earlier. So why don't we dive in, use the time we have to kind of talk about some of these articles. We, we tend to kind of start each week talking a little bit about some economic factor. And, you know, I, We kind of come all the way back around full circle each week with, you know, we've got this lukewarm thing happening in the in the economy. You know, the Fed spoke the other day again. And it just I just watched this. I I was thinking about Charlie Brown with, you know, blah, 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 blah. You know, again, it's like, well, we're not sure. And we may reserve the right to raise and this and that. But that said, things are maybe looking a little bit better there. We've got some information about manufacturing production, you know, tenths of a percentage points that we keep seeing up and down and so forth. So what are your guys' thoughts on on kind of this production piece that we talked about here? Mike, Mike, what are you seeing? I'm interested in your take. And especially we talk about this a lot during the the show is a lot of this is regionally. You know, a lot of this depends on your region, where you are, what's happening. What What are you seeing in your neck of the woods? For sure. So regionally, Alaska is a little bit removed, right? We're very we're very resource uh, development dependent. And so that's up and down. And we're a little bit used to that cycle. And it seems kind of like uh, when the rest of the country hits a lull, we seem to hit a spike and and vice versa. And that's uh, we're, we're grateful we're diversified with with locations, you know, in, in the lower 48 and up here in Alaska. But we're, we're still seeing strong demand. We're, we're hitting record months. Um, you know, broadly, we've been hearing about this slowdown or the recession that's coming. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of tease with some of my colleagues in, in our industry is we refuse to participate. We're, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're full steam ahead. However, I love there, that. There, you know, and, and, and so whether it's we're, we're out there taking market share or we're, we're finding new applications for our products, um, we're, not, we're not really overly uh, concerned about a, a recession. Um, I do, I do think there are some things that are causing us to, to make some changes and, and our manufacturers are talking about slowdown. And I, th- I think that's, that's primarily because of most people, you know, really, really did some, uh, I don't know if we call it panic buying, but there was a lot of, you know, inflations of inventory. And I think we're, some of the distributors are starting to right size that now, um, which is, which is you're seeing in the manufacturing, you know, see some 
order lag and things like that. But uh, we're still a, we're still seeing strong demand at the end user. Mike, I'm glad you you shared that. When I was going to kind of ask you a question uh, uh, related to that, and, and not necessarily related to ARG, but just as you see in the in the broad picture, and we've got Duncan here with us from Canada, who runs a distribution company as well. Uh, and do the typical, so not the highly capitalized and not the struggling, but does the typical um, wholesale distributor rely a lot on lending facilities on an, on an ongoing basis, or is it kind of balanced to have a line of credit just in case we need it? And the reason I ask that is tied to what we're seeing with interest rates and so forth and, and the potential impact of that. Yeah, you know, and, and and definitely there's a range, right? From the right. from the from the medium to the small. I think most of the small uh, operations, smaller operations that are running successfully, um, are not using a lot of credit. Uh, you know, we at our company we have one small banking relationship, and we've used that very successfully for all of our acquisitions and expansions. Other than that, we've been fortunate enough to kind of handle everything out of our own cash flow. We don't have a like a revolving line of credit that we use. Um, However, interest rates are ticking up, and that that uh, typically on those in in you know those business loans that uh, uh, you know those those are a fixed rate, and so we are mm -hmm. watching closely. Good, good. All right. Well, let's just keep watching what's happening out there and kind of pay attention across the board. You know, there's a potential rebound effect from all of these things. So I'm I'm hoping that you know. I, and by the way. Uh, that might be the best phrase I can remember in a long time on this broadcast was we refuse to participate. <laughs> I love that. Right. Because that's the, you know, I was at, at one of the, one of the industry buying associations or buying groups, I should say uh, national meeting last week with affiliated distributors in Denver. And that's the tone, right? It's like our businesses are strong. Our customers are working. They're paying their bills for the most part, you know, things are, things are fine out there. And, you know, you've heard us say here on the broadcast over and over again, right? Tom always says, don't watch the news. Yeah. We just happen to have a news show every Friday, but don't watch the news in between is Tom's mantra. So. All you need to know is here. Like if you don't, if... Go ahead, Tom. No, I was going to say, all you need to know is here. So why watch the news during the week? It's like, <laughs> it's all here. Right, all right Kevin, let's go. move on. Yep. Jump ahead. So this auto strike, the, uh, it's nine o'clock Eastern time, which I think was the deadline. And I, as I saw in the news this morning, because I did watch the news this morning a little bit, no changes with the UAW strike. So they're going to hit a bunch of other plants. Um, Mike, we were talking earlier. You had uh, been at a show, I think, uh, last week with a shift conference with uh, MDM in, in Colorado. Uh, I think the best picture I saw of that whole thing was was Tom Gale trying to mimic uh, Deion Sanders. Those sunglasses, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, the uh, that was a pretty pretty funny picture on the uh, you can see that on the MDM uh, LinkedIn site if you'd like to. It was pretty amusing, but you know I think you had said that you know why don't you share a little bit about what some of the discussions with your some of your colleagues were? Yeah, so I, I love going to these conferences that are a little bit outside my vertical, uh, just wholesale distribution in general, and I make new friends every time. It's awesome, but for some reason or another, hosers tend to find each other, right? And so I ran into. Uh, I, I ran into a large distributor in the in the Detroit, Michigan area uh, in, in our industry and we, we became, uh, you know, acquainted. And, and so I, I thought, hey, you know, I'm going to ask him about this strike. And uh, I'm like, how's that affecting your business? Are you you know, are you worried about that? And he's like, <laughs> he's like, these guys do this every three to five years. And it's a lot of, you know, it's in the news and the politicians use it to, you know, leverage and. And everything like that but we're pretty used to it i go so it's kind of like us in alaska with oil prices up and down he mm -hmm. goes yeah it's probably the same thing um and i asked him about ev and if that was really driving that and he said mm, you know we, we've got so much business you know in that arena it doesn't really matter whether they're burning gas or electricity we're still we're still selling lots of products um but uh he, he didn't seem to think it was it was uh you know too much too much going on for him now that said, I, I, you know, I think that these workers are asking for a heck of a lot, right? Going back to, you know, pensions of the yesteryear and a 32 hour work week with a 40% in, you know, I, I support workers and I think you got to treat your people right. But, uh, oh my word, boy, um, you know, I, I know in distribution, we're looking for employees everywhere. So, um, 
the uh, the auto workers got to pay attention because because there's definitely places for people to go to work, but they're, I think they're asking for a lot. Well, it's you know I, I I've got to be I have strong opinions about personally about unions and I think they played an absolutely wonderful place and were needed at the turn of the century, and then you know now there's just a, there's a lot of other jobs out there, and mm-hmm. um, we've got technology coming in right into a lot of organizations and this plays into this right right now we've got uh, there was an article we didn't end up using last week but and i wish i would have kept it but there's kind of an ai component right with this as well we've got you know the writer strike going on we've got all kinds of things going on out there that are the components of it are tied to artificial intelligence and people worried about their jobs and when you look at this what you had just mentioned to me it's like and by the way tom if i can't have a 40 percent raise and a 32 hour week, I'm not coming in Monday, Just, you know? So. <laughs> okay. Well, it's a nice, nice day in you. Yeah. Yeah. You'll miss me. Right. Uh, yeah. the, uh, no, I mean, it, it, think about that, right. These are not poorly paid people to start with, you know, and, and it's not that they're not skilled. I've, I've had an opportunity early in my career. I've been in four or five, at least Ford plants and multiple GM plants and, and uh, it's, it's not that they're bad people, but you know what? At the end of the day, you got to you got to be able to sell a car at a reasonable price, too, and return the dollars to you as a shareholder. Yeah. Right. And so there's a balancing act that they're going to have to find here. I, I agree, Kevin, that the AI and the automation that's continuing to roll forward is going to only put pressure on that you know, request for those higher wages. Um, it's uh, it's amazing. Um to think about what's going to happen. And it's sometimes scary. And I know it's driving some of the things that you're going to talk about in some of these other articles, but yeah. um, I think people have to recognize that there's a definite requirement for upskilling coming and it's going to change how we do work. And it's going to change our ability to demand, you know, the type of demands that they're asking for, for these type of jobs. And, and I think autom- honestly, their demand, their demands are only going to throw gas on the fire for these big manufacturers to push harder into automation. And that's, you know, that's an interesting piece, right? And, and we could spend the day talking about this. I, I, I laugh as we think about this in my mind is my mother retired as an administrator at a medical center. Mm-hmm. And the last three years that she was there, she was in the same union that my father-in-law is in as a retired iron worker. <laughs> the iron workers came in and organize the administrative staff. Mom had no choice, right? And so you see this, you know, this thing building on itself. And I, I'm concerned, you know, for, for things in general, but to come back and say, we want a 40% raise over a few years, and then all these other concessions, because part of that is thinking about, well, if we get there, we'll never go back. And at least the people that get to keep their job when all these other things are going on, whether it's AI driven or it's, you know, um, digital twins in factories or whatever it might be. Right. And there was an article I just read the other day about it was talking about um, co-robots, right? Robots and humans working side by side together on projects. As all that's going to happen and it's going to impact the the United Auto Workers and all the auto plants, it's going to be interesting. The downside of this, besides what could come later, and it was mentioned in this particular article, too, was, you know, it, it's it's something that I'm sure most people that are outside with a picket sign aren't thinking about is, you know, if that plant is producing parts that need to go to a um, to a dealer for replacement parts, what, what about the emergency vehicles, right? I don't know about what it's like in Alaska or Tom, where you are in, in uh, New Hampshire this week, but where Tom and I normally live in California, it's hard to find a police vehicle that's not a Ford. Yeah. Right. It's yeah. Fords and, and, and Dodge and, uh, and um, uh, Chevy vehicles are abundant in the fire service and, mm-hmm. and law enforcement as well. So how do you get those parts for that paramedic unit van? Right if this is all going on. So that talks about this, about the trickle down effect and so forth. So I'm sure they'll come to some concessions. And to your point earlier, Mike, these, this happens regularly. I remember I'm an old guy. Um, I remember lots of these. I don't ever remember 32 hour weeks and 40% increases. Yeah. That's uh that's a big ask. Yep. So 
that we started talking about AI, you know, we a little bit in that discussion, we talk about uh, AI pretty regularly, right? You were at the shift conference last week. That was a, a big topic there. There's the distribution strategy groups upcoming event in Chicago next month, big topic there. And there's a lot of underlying things. And in, in this next article, you know, we, if you just read the newsletter coming out or looked at your screen and you wonder why are these guys talking about Poland investigating, you know, OpenAI, the maker of ChatGPT. One of the things that we love to do here each week, though, is really talk about kind of the story behind the story as opposed to just a piece of news. And Tom, I'm going to kind of throw this over to you real quick. You know, this is talking about GDPR and privacy issues and so forth. Can you talk about not only with this article, but kind of some of this broader? Yeah, I mean, the fact is, is the, I don't think they're going to need to investigate all that much to find out that there are all kinds of different privacy issues, quote unquote, I will put those in quotes or in air quotes around what's going on with AI in general and large language models and chat GPT and so forth. Um, so, you know, I don't know why Poland happened to be the first one to kind of jump in and start investigating this. And like I said, I don't think they're going to have to, to work too hard to find, to find the issue. I think the bigger issue that, and this kind of ties into maybe the next story we're going to get into as well is, you know, and Mike, you touched on this a little bit. I don't know that there's anything that doesn't need to be rethought in the new world of AI. I think that you have to be willing to take a step back and look at, you know, a lot of the GDPR stuff was based around, you know, using your email address and all of that kind of stuff without permission in Europe right. and some of the rules behind that. And it was fine for what it is, but it doesn't even make sense in this new world. I think you have to take a step back and look at some of these things in an entirely new context. And I think a lot of these regulations and things that we've done are going to have to be, if not thrown out, revamped considerably along the way. You know, Mike, what's your what's your take? Yeah, I, I agree. I think um, there's a perception of privacy and, and all of that that we have. And then there's the reality that we live in based on the tools that we're adopting and willingly using every day, if you think about it. Um, but but yeah, I think the the emergence of AI in a whole new way and how it's going to touch just about everything that we do uh, in our personal lives and in our business lives is gonna is gonna be discussed. Uh, you know, it's 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 and and I think discussion is good, right? I think that that's going to lead to the best result. Um, I, I do worry uh, when governments get involved because I think that uh, there's there's sometimes you know different value propositions depending on on who they're yeah. who they're trying to serve but um i think discussion around this is good and i think there's there's gonna be lots of court cases there's gonna be lots of legislation um just as there was when the internet arose you know a couple decades ago well right. and you just have you know whether it's privacy or copyright or i mean you just look at the i don't know it's just hard for me sometimes to put some of these old school or older regulations and try and fit them into this new, more modern way of doing things. It's, it's, I, that's going to be a hard, hard job. Well, it's yeah, also not even create, just a hard job to, to, to track, but to actually manage. Yeah. It's also going to create a whole new category of ambulance chasers, right? <laughs> For sure. Yeah. The whole yeah. new group of yeah. lawyers that are going to now be experts on this and want to, want to find out whether the bathroom had a railing in it or not for you. Right. Well, I it, think I think IP rules are going to change, uh, and you you brought up legislation. I think IP rules are going to necessarily change and morph, similar to the music industry, right? If you think back twenty years ago, you know, if you wanted to buy some music, you bought a a CD or or whatever, and the music it was a very small group of of companies that controlled that access to the music, and you know, uh, the iPhone kind of and Apple Music kind of blew that up. Are, are people still making music? Absolutely. Is it democratized the making and, and distributing of music? Absolutely. Uh, are people still getting paid 100%? It's just, it just changed and, and, and probably improved if you ask most people. I think that's a great comparison to all of this, right? And, and wondering how all that would play out. I think what's interesting here, though, is, you know, and, and Tom, you had mentioned about, you know, this not being difficult for them. I think this was, you know, this group in Poland throwing a throwing a bomb into the, you know, into the fire, so to speak, with uh, on behalf of the the European Union. And so there, you know, what's one of the things I want to do a little reading on 
Uh, we've talked about it a few times here, but really kind of get a grasp on where the EU is. I know they're ahead of the U.S. in this, but the next article we're going to discuss talks about the U.S. wanting to have something in place within a series of months. So I think the, the e, this is going to need to be right because we're thinking about data that potentially is going to move and go across the entire Internet in very different ways than it ever has before. And so we're going to need some global standards, I think, to go with this, not just what did the EU say and what does the U.S. say? Um, U.S. wants to talk about it partially because, you know, politicians in this country need something to banter about. But secondly, is ta they're talking about the competitive nature, right? Where does it leave the U.S. In, in a competitive standpoint? So I think it'll be interesting. Tom, anything else you want to jump ahead and talk about this? No, let's 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 jump ahead. I think this next one here, you know, titled Musk tells Musk, Elon Musk tells Congress the consequences of getting AI wrong are severe. And I was I was listening to an interview with Sam Altman, the uh, CEO of of OpenAI. And the most he, he was being asked, he was he was being asked, you know, he's traveling all the world and all over the world and introducing OpenAI and ChatGPT to different companies or countries and different governments. And, he, and the question to him was, what is the most, you know, you, what, what do you, as you're talking to people, what are you finding unique or what are you finding, you know, questions you're getting that you wouldn't have expected? And what he said was, is the biggest thing that he has found is that most people, when he first talks to them, believes that ChatGPT as it exists today is the end all be all, like they've done. They finished the mm. development, they finished the product. Right. This is it, right? Yeah. He's like, this, this is, is such T. a tiny, yeah, this is such the tiny tip of the, it's not even a Model T, it's like a horse and buggy, right? This is such the tip of the iceberg. And, you know, some of the things that are coming that are, I mean, chat GPT, as we know, it was really like a prototype for us as, as consumers to just get an idea of what's possible. It right. wasn't designed to be the end all be all. And, you know, what he said is just, it, the people don't have any real understanding of what is going to be coming and the power of what's going to be coming. You know, and Mike, that's certainly going to have major disruption and major impact to businesses as we talk about each week. But as, as we, as we look at this article, I agree that the consequences of AI could be problematic. I don't agree that the way that to handle it is to try and create a government regulatory body that doesn't know anything about this. And I also think that the people like the Microsofts and the, you know, Facebooks or Meta or whatever that are getting in on this, there, there's a bit of a self-serving aspect oh, yeah. of it. They can go in and create the rules, right? It's going to, you know, and they have the money and the wherewithal to create the rules. What is that going to do to the little guy? Yeah, let's go. Let's, so, let's go back to the music, the music analogy. Like, I, cause I totally agree. I, I think it's important that we're talking about this because I think, there's a lot of concern. There's a lot of excitement and you could be anywhere on the spectrum there. But I, I kind of think these these guys, these tech guys sitting there and and especially Musk, that's a pretty hyperbolic statement, right? There's somewhat north of a, of a zero chance that AI could kill us all. I mean, yeah. you know, come on. So part of this seems a little self-serving, like, hey, we we got, we own this thing. We got our hands around this thing. And you it's better really ask scary. me what the you answer better, is. You better listen to us, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. right. No, oh, and I can think about it, right? If you can make the rules of the game, then you know or define or influence the rules of the game i mean and especially let's face it the politicians don't really understand this so it may all sound good but what's happening now is you're really blocking some of the other smaller companies to be able to come in and and do that because they can't get through some of the regulatory hoops that these larger companies can get through you know tom okay. and i do think it's a problem because i think companies will go offshore they'll start and you know doing things and so do I think that it's, this is something that has to be absolutely watched and looked at and, and I don't like to use the word pleased, but really monitored? Absolutely. But is this the right way? I'm not, I, don't, I don't think so, but no one's asked my opinion so far, but you know, who knows? Well, I think what, what really ties into this, and, it, and I, I will make the analogy, is uh, Mike, I, I don't know exactly what uh, within the... Hey, by the way, as a side note, you made a comment earlier. Is it appropriate for somebody that's not a hoser to call a hoser a hoser? And we we'll take it. We'll take okay, it. okay, because I I love that. Uh, and if you're and if you're Canadian, you got to put a after it. Okay, perfect, perfect, perfect. 
Yep, the uh, hoser, eh? Perfect. <laughs> I'm writing this down. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start my emails to you. Hey, hey, hoser. Hey, uh, hoser. But but you know, you, I know you guys do a lot. You know, obviously, a big part of your business is hoses, fittings, but you also do a lot as an example with lifting straps and hoists and things like that. I assume now my background is in the industrial safety world where we're totally tied to uh, industry standards, American National Standards Institute, ANSI standards and so forth. I'd assume in your market there are, are industry standards for things. Is that correct? For sure. Well, both on the, on the lifting and rigging side, it's, it's more highly controlled, right? ASME and OSHA control a lot sure. of that. A lot around fabrication tagging all of that right. uh, information and then on the hose and fitting side it's a little a little more open right like so uh, uh probably one of the best resources is uh NAHA, the national association mm -hmm. for hose and accessory distribution has the hose safety institute which really has published and a lot it was of right hose safety week uh, last week right it was it was hose and safety week last week yep. and, I, and we had a, it was a first a first time uh doing that it was a uh, a great uh effort by lots of member companies well, the reason the reason I asked that is that's in my mind, that's where this all ties together is we don't need Congress to say X, Y and Z. It, I don't, in my opinion, it doesn't need legislation. It needs some standards bodies. And when you have this, I mean, I, I just think about it. You know, if you think about a, a pair of safety glasses, right, right on the inside of the safety glass, it should say it was a Z87.1. Right. That's the ANSI standard that they're saying we meet, right? right? And if there's some standards that come with AI and so forth like this, that now, and, and what's interesting about, right, when you have that is if you chose to buy something that's not ANSI compliant, as an example, using maybe a, a lifting strap or a, a pair of safety glasses, and, um, and it's not compliant to that, the doors that are open from a, a legal standpoint are the floodwaters are coming at you, right? right? Because it's very simple in court to say, you were aware, right? You chose not to do these things and hence here's your liability. And somebody and was injured, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree with that. I think, you know, one of the things that, that Musk said that was right was the, the referee comment, right? Mm -hmm. it, I, I don't think we need a police person, to, right. a policeman. I think we need a referee, somebody that's, oh, yeah. and somebody that's willing to, you know, say, hey, these are, and, and a, and a, uh, a body that that creates best practices and standards to to prevent people yep. uh, from being hurt as much as possible. But I do think it's smart that it's the United States that's leading this effort, uh, at least in the discussion. Right? I, I think that that's good for us. And I, I think it's silly that politicians say, "Well, we're going to have some legislation crafted in three months," or worse yet, an executive action on AI. I mean, that yeah. that made me follow. Well, and going back full circle, they don't even know what that is. Right, That's because it's, they're going to base it off of what they see today or know today, and and you know just some of the things automation wise. We were just touching on this a minute ago with with the auto worker piece, right? Mm -hmm. Some of the things that are going to be able to be automated intelligently are I don't think most I, I I know I don't even comprehend it, right? And I study this stuff all the time. It's like it's yep. incomprehensible some of the things that are are going to be possible. So how are they going to put something together in three months that would make any sense at all well you know and a big chunk of this is grandstanding too right we we've watched this i mean it was and i think that's you mentioned this earlier tom you know as we've got this is a little bit of the uh what do they call it the the fox in the hen house or whatever right you've got mm -hmm. you know this oversight group that doesn't even understand truly what they're trying to put oversight on right now and then you've got this group of i'll call them foxes Right. That are saying, I, I want to lead the charge in this because, you know, I know. Right. What what should be. And I think I, I take this back to it. And I've mentioned this before on our broadcast, but watching uh, a Senate hearing panel grilling Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook about what data they keep and what they have. And this one senator, and it wasn't like he was 90 years old, like lots of them are. I mean, he was, you know, late 60s, probably. And he went on and on and on about how Facebook has listening devices in homes. And Zuckerberg's there. He's just as straight faced. I mean, I'm sure inside he's just like laughing beyond belief. And and um, Senator tells him about, you know, well, my son's going to a wedding in a couple of weeks and he's a groomsman. And he had just had this conversation with with um, 
his friends about the tuxedos that they need. And, and it wasn't like 20 minutes later that he got an ad for a tuxedo company on Facebook. I'm just like, and, and it's like, how does that happen if you don't have listening devices? And Zuckerberg's like, sir, your, your son searched the internet for at some point for tuxedos. <laughs> and hence we provided him more information on sure. what he had been searching. Well, how do you do that? And finally, it's like, sir, that that's actually how we pay our people. Right? Yeah, because that's people, the whole premise of Internet advertising. <laughs> right, because somebody paid us to put an ad to your son about something that he was already looking for. And well, that goes back and, to my and, comment about our uh, perception of, of yes. privacy versus yes. the reality of privacy as it exists today in a digital world. Yep, yep. It, it, exactly. So I, I, I think we're just going to continue to see more of this. But here, here's where I wanted to bring this back, kind of back to story behind the story. Mike, and I'm going to kind of throw this to you, my friend, is that, you know, you're, you're running a company and, you know, we've had some conversation about the technology that you use and and, and you, you guys are ahead of the game compared to a lot of people out there with what you're doing. But, and, and more importantly, I think about what you're looking at with you and your, your executive team. One of the things, though, that comes out of this is, in, in my mind, it's like, okay, if I'm, if I'm a senior executive in an organization that needs to start looking at putting AI into my org company, I know that I need to build a roadmap, right? All the presentations I'm hearing is, you know, I, I need a, a path and a roadmap for for my tech stack and where I want to be and where I want to grow to. So, and Mike, I know you're, you know, you're doing this with your team and you, like I said, you've got great people with you with Jeremy and so forth. And, and, um, but is this playing into your mind at all? Is, is like, as I'm building my tech stack, should I be paying attention to what are those regulatory requirements going to be? Should I stop and wait and see what happens over the next few months? How does that play out for a guy like you? Yeah, we're, we're not stopping and waiting. I, I think this is going to be formed at, over time. And if anything has proven out, industry has been resilient and finds ways to work over, around, under, through regulation. And, and hopefully it plays a part in crafting any kind of regulation that comes up. But yeah, we're, we're, we're thinking about this in a much more holistic way, realizing that it's going to touch just about every part of our oper operation. First and foremost, our people. And so, you know, I was at a, a, a conference for the National ESOP Association um, down in Northern California here recently. And, and that was the tone um, from some very uh, well-educated uh, AI people that came and spoke to us is that we need to be having real conversations about how this will impact our people um, and, and, and not in a scary way. Uh, you know, at the SHIFT conference, um, uh, one of the uh, Gartner fellows was there and she was speaking about AI and she said that, that AI in the end will allow humans to become more human uh, by removing some of the redundant data entry, processing, mm -hmm. repetitive tasks and allow us to focus on what we really do, which is, you know, here and not, not necessarily just here. Um, and, and that really connected with me. And so we're having conversations with our employees um, at the ground level of, OK, what are the tasks that you're doing every day that are repetitive, you know, mm -hmm. that, are, that are kind of beneath you? Right. You're an intelligent, thinking, thoughtful, caring human being. What can we do to eliminate some of this friction on your day um, and, and baking that in uh, to the conversation? So I think that's great. You know, that that's uh, that's powerful piece and and you what you just described about that with your people let's jump ahead tom to the the tech talk article that we have each week and by the way it's about the time i should plug this in i do each week if you happen to be listening on the podcast uh whether it's on apple Podcasts or spotify or odyssey or wherever you get those we are live this morning on linkedin live facebook live and youtube live with our guest mike mortensen from arg distribution and you are not seeing what the rest of the folks who are live with are seeing, which is our Around the Horn and Wholesale Distribution newsletter. It goes out every Friday morning to about 8,000 people. If you'd like to get a copy of that, let us know. So the next article, we have a feature every week that we talk about Tech Talk. This week, that article is about Walmart gets employees involved in how to use generative AI, right? I, I didn't, I didn't re look into this as far as I would have liked to, but what a great idea for an organization of that size to get an employee focus group, so to speak, to start looking at how can this make our company better and you and your job better. 
Yeah, that this article above, I think, was the best one of the of the newsletter. It really was inspiring to me because it's exactly what I'm talking about. Like, you know, where we want to go, they're already there. I'm not surprised Walmart is a huge company and they're years sure. ahead in many aspects. Um, but they're they're creating an AI playground for their employees to tell them tell them what's what what, what we should be focused on, what works for them, what AI tools uh, make their lives better. Uh, and and collecting that feedback and trying and failing and trying again and I think that's just it's it's everything that I'm hearing uh, these professionals in AI um, recommending that we do with AI in our business. They're, Walmart's tackling that head on, and so yep. it's, it's pretty impressive. Hey, yeah, you probably. I was going to I was going to mention you probably have heard, you know, Microsoft is releasing copilots AI copilots for all of the Office products. Mm -hmm. next year, but they have a number of, and I'm not sure if Walmart's one of them, but I know they have a number of beta clients that are working with them right now and providing feedback on how they're, and Microsoft's whole positioning is very similar, Mike, to what you're saying, which is, hey, how do we give, you know, some innovation and some ideas back to our, to people versus the drudgery of work, as they call it every day. And, you know, one of the things they're really looking at is even with Outlook is your inbox. Like how many, how much time do you spend going through your inbox? Okay. Do I need to reply to that? Did I forget about that? Where did that happen? How do I put some AI to that? So when I come in in the morning, Kevin, kind of like our genius feed as we call it yeah. is I have, here are the emails that really matter. And here are the emails that I really need to follow up on. And here's the one step that, it, and have that really, you know, so, so you're not spending all of this time all this drudgery time and, and administrative time, and you're actually getting stuff done that matters. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, I think I think that you know that that's really that's really where this is going to do is get help us get rid of the noise and let us listen to the music, so to speak. I, there's yeah. there's there's so many things, and it's and it's cool to see that these features are just starting to pop up in yeah. you know you, you mentioned Microsoft, and and so we're a Microsoft 365, you know employed customer and we, we do all that and um just just the tools that are starting to come up and and my people are like hey did you know this does this and it's really starting to reduce some of that noise uh, in our day that's great to hear i'm i'm looking forward to more of that coming into our company hint hint um the um it's interesting walmart you know as they talk about here they have this they call it my assistant that's a desktop or mobile app for their people working in their corporate facilities to help them get rid of monotonous tasks. So I think some of what, you know, Microsoft is hoping to do with that is, is key. And it's, you know, it's interesting because, you know, I look at our company with LeadSmart, which Tom mentioned our genius feed feature, right? Which looks across your ERP data that's coming into the CRM, your marketing automation, e-commerce data warehouses, whatever connected systems we have and looking for opportunities and risks and sending alerts to that, right? That is opportunistic, I'll call it, right? From a standpoint of how can we drive more revenues and service our customer better? The other side of this whole equation is kind of what they're talking about here is, you know, how can we get rid of some redundant tasks and, yeah. and so forth, which is really powerful to, to see with that. So I, I think we're, you know, we're living in, a, in an interesting time in the world. Tom made a comment a while back about, you know, we, the three of us were around at the start of the internet, right? Our, our kids, no idea what life is like with that. And many of them have no idea of life without a smartphone. Right. You know, it's just totally, totally different for them. So I think what we're going to see out of this, you know, in 10 years, we're going to look back to Tom's point earlier. We're going to look back about chat GPT. What was that? Right. Because there's going to be, it, it's just going to be pervasive throughout our life. Yeah. It'll, it'll be the new, the new uh, public utility, right? It's yeah, that's right. Uh, that's good. So let's, uh, good stuff. Uh, good on you, Walmart. Uh, happy to see what they're doing with that. I thought that was really cool. Uh, Mike, again, compliments to you on what you're doing with your team. Uh, one of our features every week is what we call our industry scuttlebutt. Um, we talk about different things going on in the industry. There's an article that I uh, shared here about an Alabama high school launching a distributional logistics academy. You know, we, we read, we hear, we talk all the time. Mike, you're, you're the uh, expert on our group today about what's really happening in the world in the field, but everybody talks nonstop about not being able to get enough employees. And here we've got not only, you know, I was, as I mentioned earlier, I was at a at, uh, buying groups meeting, national meeting last week in Denver. And there was the, the folks from the Texas A&M program 
uh, in distribution, industrial distribution and warehousing and so forth. We had a couple of students come and spend some time in the booth to look at our technology. But now we've got a high school that's doing this. I just love to see this. Yeah, that's awesome. Any thoughts on this further, Mike, about uh, maybe getting some uh, of your yeah. Alaska high schools to do that or, or I, Washington, I, Oregon, Idaho? <laughs> I love that. Yeah, that's so, uh, you know, I I did. I don't think I, I chose distribution. It kind of chose me. I yeah. was on track to become an attorney is really kind of where I was going to go and um, jumped into distribution and started working as a delivery driver and in, uh, in the same company that I'm in now. And man, what an amazing journey uh, industrial distribution, wholesale distribution can be for you. You get exposed to so many different things. Um, I, 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 I talk to people in our industry all the time about making what we do more accessible to the next generation. And part of that is technology, mm -hmm. right? If we're not investing in our businesses and making them feel like home when these digital natives walk into our, our, our businesses, they're going to go look for something else, right? Uh, yeah. So, so helping them understand just how important distribution is to our country, that it really makes everything that we do run and work and, and stay, and stay uh, pro productive and profitable. Um, I think that's super important. I love, uh, you know, I was at a, a conference talking to people about, um, you know, if you're in any kind of business, distribution especially, you should have a relationship with your local high school's guidance counselors. You should be out there talking to them, introducing your company to them so that they can they can, uh, you know, suggest that as an opportunity for for a, a summer job, an internship, uh, coming in and, and taking a look at what we do for a living um, and find it, find a potential career because it's 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 a great way to go. That's awesome. You know, it's it's inter interesting, Mike, is I, I come from a tech background, right? I distribution's relatively new to me over the last few years. And the, if you can go in and work in a distribution organization, especially now with some of the things we're talking about technology, and you can understand all the different nuances of supply chain and, you know, all the different partners and manufacturers and all the ecosystem, you can go to other industries, I think, and it's, it's going to be easy. It's, if you can really make it work in the whole wholesale distribution industry and learn that and really get your, I guess, sea legs, you know, as you're coming into a career, you can go to a lot of places with it. For sure. And for sure. I've just learned a lot. You know, it's a lot more. There's a lot more going on here than there is in the traditional tech company that that, that my my history or my background has been from. Yeah. yeah so, go ahead. Go ahead Mike. Mike. I was just going to say so many layers to the onion. I, I have been so blessed to learn logistics and manufacturing and production and maintenance and uh, yeah. customer service and the sales cycle and technology and finance and acquisition and merge. I, like it goes on and on and on. Right. And so um, there's just so many different things that you can, that you can learn. And to your point, Tom, I, I feel like if my life were to take a turn and, and I was to choose something different, I would have relevant skills in just about and, and on yep. any team. Yeah, exactly. No, that, that's a really good point. You know, and, and people don't stop and think about it. Right. When, when uh, in fact, week before last, I was at a, a technology conference in San Francisco and and I was watching I'll call it that ecosystem and this kind of plays off of Tom's point right is you have and, and just a, here's a simple example right Mike you, you send your people to a trade show or or an event and you if you get a booth there it's say fifteen hundred to five thousand dollars for a ten right. by ten booth right we do these events consistently with trade associations and buying groups across the board um, Fifteen hundred to five thousand dollars. A ten by ten booth is at this tech conference was fifty thousand dollars. Starting, it could depending on where you were at, it could go up to seventy. And I sat back. I was talking to a gal that's uh, in the finance world and, and venture capital world, and and um, uh, sitting in a corner, kind of in a chat, looking out across this, and we we're talking about it. And I said, you know, one of the venture capital guys that was speaking this morning his money is probably in half of these companies and they're just spending money amongst themselves. Yeah. Right now, no offense to anybody there, but when you take a look at what we talk about into Tom's points about wholesale distribution is this is what makes the world run, right? People don't think about how pipes get lifted off of a truck to go into a pipeline, right? That your company offers. Yeah. People don't think about, how the fork and knife and the glass at the dinner table at the restaurant that they're at 
actually got there. 75% of worldwide commerce goes through wholesale distribution or a channel, right? So what a great place to start with in the high schools. We're at this place in time right now, I think, where uh, blue collar work is becoming sexy again, right? Uh, we want people, you've got, uh, what was the guy's name from um, Dirty Jobs? Mike uh, Rowe. Mike, Mike Rowe. Rowe. You know, his big pitch is, hey, you know what? It's honorable to be a welder. And it is, right? Yeah. And, or a plumber, right? And so I love to see this opportunities to uh, people to get into distribution that way. So I, I, if I could just tell a quick story, yeah. I was sitting at dinner on uh, Tuesday night with the founder of a tech company who, if I said his name, you would know him for sure. Uh, but so I'm not. But we were talking about technology and tech business because ARG Industrial is now just launched as a, a partner of a tech company for our uh, for our configuration engine that we've built uh, that allows people to put things together uh, in a digital way and represent the assembly work that most of us as wholesale distributors do in some form or fashion. And so I was talking to him about that. And I said, as distributors, we take a, a thing that's worth a dollar and we sell it for two dollars. Right. And he said, huh, in tech, we put two million in and we take a million out. <laughs> and I, I'm like, wait, how does that work? I think I, I said, do you do you want to buy our tech company right now? Because I, right. I think I'm going to stay with distribution. Well, that's not how our tech company works, but I think I might know who you were talking about. Uh, the uh, That's funny. So before we jump ahead, Tom may made a great comment here. Right. Tom, maybe you can highlight that. Right. Tom, thank you for that. You know, we've got all the existing military uh, personnel who worked in logistics and so forth. The reason I really wanted to target about that, because Tom making that comment does not know, but four or five comments up in this is the author of the next article I want to talk about, which is Will Quinn from Infor. And Will Quinn was a logistics officer in the Marine Corps and now is in distribution. So, Tom, we have that other article there uh, about... Um, it's our special feature there, creating a culture of continuous improvement. And that article was written by Will. If you get a chance, um, check that out. And uh, Will's a, a regular here. In fact, I think he's our guest next week, either next week or the week after. I've got to double check. But to Tom May's point, right out of the military, supply chain stuff, logistics, warehousing. And now he's using that to support in for the ERP company's uh, customers. So if you don't get the newsletter and you want to look at that, you could just look up Will Quinn, um, the distribution guy. He has a registered trademark now for himself. Uh, you can look him up on LinkedIn. So last two articles, we don't need to spend time on those because of time today. But there's we, each week we have the good read feature. It said, should you put employees ahead of customers? Whole article about uh, Richard Branson's ideas. I, I have my own take on some of those. Mike, when we're together next over a beer, we'll chat through that. I love the concept. I've got some twists to how he does it, but I know you have, and with as an employee owned company, there's a lot of employee involvement there. The last article that we have here though, um, in fact, I think we hit them all. Yep. And um, so I think we've got all those covered today. Tom, Mike, last comments or thoughts on the day? Well, uh, you were mentioning Will, you were mentioning Will Quinn and he had a very important comment earlier that I we didn't show, which he said, you have to watch Strange Brew to get the proper use of hoser, Dan. So that's that's so my build, uh, build, my homework for this weekend. What a what a high quality duty is it? <laughs> and now we got... that's going back in the archives. There, that's right. That's right. That's right. That was that's right. Uh, that was right. That's a uh, vintage Caddyshack vintage time. That's roughly, right. right. Is about that Strange yeah. Brew. We don't make movies like uh, that anymore. I may need to uh, put that on the iPad for an airplane flight soon. <laughs> so. Uh, hey, Mike, thanks for being with us. This was awesome. Yeah. Every time we Thank chat you, with you, there's, yeah, there's good insights. Will you come back again sometime later in the year or the new year? Absolutely. That's great. We're looking forward to seeing you when you're here in Southern California, hopefully later this year. Tom, sure. you're trying to be on vacation a little bit this weekend. Um, go, go do that. We'll thank everybody for being with us today. As always, uh, we wish you a great weekend. Uh, we wish you to be safe, do good things, and be kind to others. Sounds good. Have a good one.